senior project in architecture school, you had a choice. You could go off on your own or um, create a senior seminar with a bunch of other students. And I decided with a group of students that we'd find a professor and what we really wanted to study was funereal architecture. Don't ask. Things are very funny. I um, had spent my junior year abroad in Denmark and in an architecture studies program, different school. Yale doesn't have a junior year abroad. In fact, you have to tell them that you're going abroad to study something they don't teach, which is they didn't teach Danish, so I could, because I love going into a culture if I like the architecture, and I love Scandinavian design. Um, so, boom, I went to Denmark, and one of the very first projects, we were all given different segments of Copenhagen to study, and I was given this area called Norbro, which included this enormous park, probably half the size of Central Park, it was also a cemetery, because in Europe, spaces are so tight that you, you have multiple uses. So your cemeteries are habitable. I mean, they're parks. They're, people are walking through. People are strolling through. And I think it was very interesting. And then I, as I went through Europe that summer, I went to like um, Père Lachaise in France. And it was just one of those things. So when I came back to Yale, I, th I don't know how this conversation came up, but we all there were a few of us that thought, well, um, a course as our senior seminar that focused on the architecture of death, essentially, would be really interesting. And what does that mean? It's like, oh, God, at the time, the reporters had a heyday with it. It's like morbid curiosity. It's more like how man deals with mortality in the built form. And in the course of that semester, um, Someone saw a bulletin for a competition for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and we thought, what a great idea. We'll use that as our final project. So um, I um, designed what I thought was the right solution for a course. And we had barely been given any information. Someone wrote away for the the program book late, later on and um, read through it. But in a way, I think when you're doing something in, our, in architecture school, you're doing it for yourself. And I did it. And um, it wasn't until the next semester, which was my final, my spring semester, that um, I decided to enter it into the actual competition as an exercise. Because as a student, competitions are how you learn. They're what you do as good, good exercise. The only clue that I had um, to what I had made was that um, for the final crit, you invite visiting architects to um, critique your work. And then you get up and you present. So I presented my piece. And then over that Christmas holiday, I was visiting a friend's uncle my girlfriend and we went up to see his house um, in Vermont, a fairly well-known um, architect. And he, he was going to give me advice on my senior portfolio so I could get out and look for a summer job. And he's looking through, and then he stops. And he starts telling me, because as he gets to like the sketches for the Vietnam, I, you know, I'd included them in the portfolio, he, go, he starts telling me about this design for the Vietnam Memorial that he had heard about. And as he starts talking about it, I realize he's telling me about my design. And I'm realizing I, I should enter this because I think it's an important thing to say. It's not going to win. And I entered it. Probably fundamentally, a previous design had been a memorial to World War III, and I started studying what what the nature of a monument is, and um, what a monument should be. And I designed for the World War III memorial. I designed a futile, almost terrifying passage that ends nowhere. And the professor of the class was 
extremely disturbed. And he comes up to me afterwards and says, if I had a brother that died in that war, I would never want to visit the memorial. And I looked at him and I said, Andy, this is World War III. We're not going to be around. <laughs> Don't you get it? I mean, he just didn't get it. So every memorial, every memorial in its time has a different goal. For me, what uh, the Vietnam Memorial had to be was about honesty, about dealing up front with individual loss. Now, it turns out it was also a requirement by the veterans to list the 57,000 names. Now, you've got to ask again, this is probably the first time where the group of veterans have requested it. We're reaching a time in, it's almost a modern time that will acknowledge the individual in a war on a national level, rather than what has happened in previous wars throughout history, it was always a political statement by the winning leader about the victory. The foot soldier didn't count, except in World War I memorials, which I had study and realized the effect they had, they were so moving, was because they focused on individual loss. But I think that's, that is the definition of a modern I, approach to war the acknowledgment of individual lives lost. In anything I've done, what I will do is resist picking up a pen, except to write for as long as I can. And what I want to do is try to understand what I want to do as an idea. There's a book coming out in the fall. It's my first book where, again, um, it's as much a written book as a art book. And um, I say in there, I try to think of a work as an idea without a shape. If I find the shape too soon, especially for the memorials, which have a function, then I might be predetermining a form and then stuffing the function into the form. Instead, what I try to do is for two to three months read research, understand anything about the site. And I don't just mean the physical site. I mean the cultural site, the historical site, who's coming, what the needs are, what I think needs to be done. The most important thing I thought was the acknowledgement of a loss. We have to face it. If we can't face death, then we'll never overcome it. So as opposed to pretending it never happened, you have to look at straight in the eye. Then you can turn around and walk back out into the light. So I wanted something that would be honest about the war, not say anything political. Now, I deliberately did not read anything about the Vietnam War because I made a judgment which is very different from civil rights, because I read everything I could on the civil rights era. With the Vietnam War, I really felt the politics of the war eclipsed what happened to the veterans, that the politics were irrelevant to what this memorial was, that I had to make an apolitical statement. I needed to, because there were people on that wall who were for it. There were people on that wall who were against it. I wanted to offend neither of them. That was a huge goal. So I deliberately did not want to know anything about the politics behind the war. The use of the name and the chronology of the name all came a little later. Going back to the question, so here's this two to three month verbal process of which the earlier design for a World War III monument allowed me to research memorials, the history of memorials, what they should be. And um, then I visit the site. Boom, put all that science, analytic, away and allow the art side to come out. And yes, then I just um, lay an egg is the joke. Uh, why an egg? Because an egg is an idea comes out fairly fully formed. 
I don't work it and work it and work it. The idea is there. It happens overnight sometimes. It happens when I'm at a site sometimes. I know it right away, and I knew it when I saw the site. I wanted to cut it open and open up the earth and polish the earth's edges. Then came the embellishment of the names having to be chronological, which had to be key. And it turns out a lot of my works deal with a passage which is about time because I don't see anything that I do as a static object in space. It has to exist as um, a journey in time. So time plays out in a lot of my works. That in a nutshell is that design. Right away. <laughs> Took nine months. Uh, Hell was breaking loose. I just wasn't aware it was breaking. I was, I, you know, it's like you're very young. You're very sure of yourself. So it didn't even occur to me that it was a big deal. I mean, my attitude is I had studied how um, competitions are handled in Washington. And basically, for the most part, things never get built the way they were drawn. It is a small miracle that the memorial looks exactly the way it was designed. Um, the embellishments are later, extra, but the form itself, you have to go through five governmental agencies two times for review. That's normally where architectural projects, art projects, get extremely modified, to put it kindly. I was amazed. The architects of record, Cooper Leckie, Kent Cooper, came up to me before my first meeting. And um, he said, now, now, now be prepared. These people are going to be pretty tough on you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, OK. And I get in there, and literally this tough architect and the Fine Arts Commission leans over and says, Maya, is this what you want? <laughs> are you sure this is what you want? They haven't done anything to change it? And I'm like, these people are so nice. Everyone was so nice within these five legal, correct channels. In fact, technically, if you look at it, there should have been no problem. The controversy was completely extra. It was like this weird baggage that was thrown in because Reagan, Secretary of the Interior Watt, H. Ross Perot all kind of got together and decided the design wasn't right. Ah, and so Secretary of the Watt withheld groundbreaking until a technical compromise was met. It was, by that time the Secretary of the Interior was only supposed to check to see the funding was in place which it was, but Washington is political and full of compromises. So the so the three statues were decided would be the would be the, um, the what was necessary. Now, you you have to understand that when they originally proposed it, the walls are only ten feet high. They were proposing twelve foot, fourteen foot high statues that would go right at the apex, and um, and so we fought like hell. Um, and the Fine Arts Commission was instrumental. We all knew a compromise had to be meted out, but exactly where that compromise was, um, was the one where the risk was, we're going to let groundbreaking go. They're going to give us groundbreaking if we can okay this. Then we're going to push and push and push. I actually completely understood why the um, there was such a strong opposition to it. In a way, what they didn't realize was that a lot of the struggle, a lot of the fight was because there was a requirement that all the names be listed. Ironically, that was something the veterans chose. You know, that politically, deep down under, you're of two camps. And basically in American memorial art, architecture, the, the camp has always been the latter. I, it's a little bit of a denial. I, I don't want to see the dead. I don't want to acknowledge that because it's too painful. I want the parade. I want the happy. I want the, the exalted. And um, 
I think it was a very modern notion in a national capital to list all the names. That's what was very controversial. Okay, it was black. It was below grade. I was female, Asian American, um, young, too young to, to have served. Or even the way I would talk, oh, I didn't know much about the war. It, it's sort of like you have to be that person in order to understand those needs. And I think none of the opposition in that sense hurt me. I think there were a couple things that did hurt. Um, I think the artist who did the three statues, um, as an artist to another artist, I didn't understand that. It's funny, I probably went in there with more sort of an egomaniacal young artist confidence and I actually became, I think, a little mellower. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how is, uh, when you're young, you're so idealistic and you're so headstrong, or at least I was. I actually probably decided, oh, people are going to think I'm so egomaniacal because of the Vietnam Memorial that I, I tried to be a little more humble. Though All my friends say I'm not at all more humble, so I don't know. As far as what I took away from, at a certain point in time, nobody would touch me with a 10-foot pole. There were my lawyers. There was one writer or one um, person who I think used to own the New Republic who came in my support in one of these Senate testifying hearings. hearings. No one else would touch me. I tried Yale Connections. I tried this. I tried anything to try to protect the design. The AIA was wonderful. You know, the arts groups were. but. Um, you know, I was sort of like untouchable because everyone didn't quite know how people would react to it. And then, a year later, when like the millionth visitor came to it, everybody wanted to like say hello, that sort of thing. And I, I mean, I was a little jaded. I mean, my attitude is, I'm glad it's a success. I mean, I'm glad people, um, really are moved by it. That was its goal. But you do these things because you personally believe in it. And it was lonely. I mean, it was lonely being in this one testifying room where everyone else was on the other side, looking at me like I was trying to deliberately hurt them. And, um, you know, it, it was, it, it, it sort of probably jaded me. Well, it's funny. As you live through something, you're not aware of it. It's only in hindsight that you realize what indeed your childhood was really like. Growing up, I thought I was white. Didn't occur to me that I wasn't white. Probably didn't occur to me I was Asian American until I was studying abroad in Denmark, actually and there was a little bit of prejudice, racial discrimination, because as I get a suntan, I look like a Greenlander. And as the U.S. had a certain prejudice against Native Americans, the Danes had a similar read towards the Greenlanders, and all of a sudden, they would be moving away from me in the bus. They wouldn't sit next to me. There would be these weird comments. And um, growing up, I think I was very, I would say naive on one hand about fitting in, though in reality um, I was not a participant in many school functions. My, our home life was very, very close-knit. It was my mother, my father, my brother, and I. I never knew my grandparents on either side. Um, when I was very little, we would get letters and they'd be censored from China, in Chinese, and um, so we were a very insular little family. And 
it didn't occur to me that I didn't really socialize that much. I loved school. I studied like crazy. I, I, I was a class A number one nerd. And um, when I wasn't in school studying, I was taking all my, um, I was taking a lot of independent courses at the university. And if I wasn't doing that, I was, my dad was Dean of Fine Arts and I was um, casting bronzes in the school foundry. So I was basically using the university as a playground, probably because I didn't fit in in high school at all. And um, I don't know if it was because I was different. I think my age, I looked much younger than most of my classmates. And in a way, they were really nice to me, but almost as a baby sister, like I think as a little girl, there was a, uh, a bit of a China doll sort of syndrome. And so I, they were friends and they were friendly, but I, I didn't date. I didn't really even begin to understand. I was very naive, so I studied and I loved getting A's and I was like, I think I was like highest grade point average in my high school and I loved to study. I just, I just, but I did, had no like extracurricular activities. My activities were absolutely isolated. Um, I would make anything artistic at home. Um, and I think, I think creativity and my artistic drive emanates from that um, that childhood, in a way, I didn't have anyone to play with, so I made up my own world. But I had very few friends, and I think my brother had a few more friends than me. But I think we stayed close to home, and I also think we always ate dinner with our parents. We didn't want to go out. It wasn't about going out. Like I think, I think the whole American adolescence was a lot wilder than what I would have felt comfortable with in that sense. We stayed very close to home, family-wise. Um, I think that's Chinese. I think, um, you know, I, I mean, I think it wasn't just me because it was also, I think, my brother had I th think many more friends, but um, but still, he was. I mean, we we weren't like um, going to the proms or going to the football games or doing anything of that nature at all. I don't think I ever went to a football game, which at Athens High School was, you know, the Bulldogs were the Bulldogs. But and so there was a part of me that was like, oh, how many days do I have before I can get out of this town? I mean, at one hand, you had a university there, so I could sneak out and um, take courses. But at the other hand, it's, it's Athens High, and um, it, it was tough to fit in. And I, I, I was aware of that by the time I hit my senior year. I basically was taking almost all of my courses independent study, and um, taking many of my courses at the university, and um, counting the days. Because I, I knew, I, knew I, uh, I didn't quite fit in at that point, and I was desperate to kind of get out of there. And, um, you know, it was, it was almost more instinct. I have probably fundamentally antisocial tendencies. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. I mean, it's very, very interesting because I think you have here a group of kids that are uh, probably we were of the same honor rolls and the same grade point averages. But because I never took one extracurricular activity, I just failed utterly at that level. And part of me still rebels against that. I, you couldn't put me in a um, kind of like a social group setting. I don't, you know, I mean, now it's different with your group friend. But as far as like those, um, the different clubs, I mean, I'm actually a terrible anarchist probably deep down under, but that also could be my parents are both college professors, and again, you want to question authority, and you want to question standards and traditions and whatever. It's, it's so like, I don't know, I just wasn't very interested. So yeah, odd man out, odd woman out. We were unusually brought up in that there was no gender differentiation. Uh, in, in that my father really, 
I was lucky as a girl in my family life to never, ever be thought of as any less than my brother. And um, that the only thing that mattered was what, what you would do in life. And it wasn't about success being money, it was about help, you know, teaching or learning. Oh, there was a very strong emphasis within the family, especially on my mother's side, about academia, study. And I loved school. And all that I wanted to do was keep going to school. I think I got out of graduate school and I went through withdrawal. All my friends were going, phew, aren't we glad it's over? And I'm going, <gasps> you know, I mean, my whole world has been, has been a college environment. And I really respect it. I really respect people that, in a way, focus their energies on, on, on education, on learning, for the sake of learning. And I think that and the fact that as a child, I was never told I couldn't do something because I happened to be a girl. I mean, it was almost like I'm, I'm the opposite way. It's just, it's what you learn up here, what you think up here, that's all that counts. Nothing else really matters. always trying to impress the older sibling. <laughs> what does the older sibling do? Always try to like humiliate the younger sibling. I don't know. We had a very healthy sibling rivalry and um, fought a lot and our best friends. And very, you know, very, very different and yet we're very close. Um, I have one brother, one older brother, Ton. In fact, we collaborated on an artwork of mine. He's an English professor and a poet, and we did a piece for the Cleveland Public Library called Reading a Garden, where the centerpiece is a water, pool of water, where the title of the piece, Reading a Garden, is spelled backwards, but reflects forward in the water, which clues you in that this poetry garden, it's sort of a, uh, a poem laid out three-dimensionally. It, it's all about words and the directionality and weight of, of reading. So. Didn't fight the whole time. And, you know, collaborating on a work of art is, when you have two artists, is very tricky. But, it, it, okay, it took us 30 or 40 years to get to that point. <laughs> Not much. And I think it's a very interesting thing, and I think it happens with first generation of a certain era. If you talked probably to Asian Americans now, you're brought up bilingual. Back then, way back then, um, my, our parents decided not to teach us Chinese. Now they'll say that we weren't interested, but I think part of it was they wanted us to fit in. It was an era when they felt we would be better off if we didn't have that complication. Ten years later, it had already switched, where, no, you want b both cultures coming out um, when you're very young. I think 30 years ago, it was more like, oh, let's, let's make you as comfortable in your, new, in your new climate. Basically, so my mother says, I'll say, oh, you didn't tell us much about your family history. And my mother will say, oh, you never asked. <laughs> and I think in that is a key. I would probably venture to guess that they didn't speak much about it because in a way it might have been painful for them because they had to leave all their family, all their friends. And because they weren't going to be offering it up, we didn't ask. And I think it actually got me into a lot of trouble um, later on. Like say for instance when I was building the Vietnam Memorial because I never once asked the veterans, any of the group that I was working with, how, what was it like in the war? Because from my point of view, you stay reserved. You don't pry into other people's business. They, I think, in turn, were hurt that I didn't ever seem interested in their lives. I think, again, that is very much a part of my upbringing. It's very hard for me to like ask people, unless they offer it. But um, I didn't really find out more about my family's history and it's, it's, there's some wonderful parts, like on my father's side, one of his aunts 
And he told me this at my 21st birthday. Um, only after we were in Washington and there was an embassy party at the Chinese embassy and my father was going on and on with the Chinese ambassador and they were just talking and talking and talking and afterwards I said you know what, what were you talking about and he goes oh we were talking about my father and it turns out my grandfather on my father's side helped to draft one of the first constitutions of China he was a fairly well-known um, scholar then it turns out one of my father's sisters and her husband were um, Lin Weiyin and Liang Suchang, who are these very well-known architectural historians in China. They, um, they actually studied at University of Pennsylvania and brought modernism back to China, helped design Tiananmen Square, realized later on that they should be preserving more of the old than the new, but by that time it was too late. But in a way, they, they did help bring communism, uh, modernism in, but at the same time, they had also put together a manuscript documenting all the architectural temple styles of ancient China. The manuscript was lost, and then Wilma and John Fairbanks found it years later and published it, at which point Wilma Fairbanks just published another book on um, Liang and Lin. And so um, they were written about in Jonathan Spence's books, uh, The Gate of Heavenly Peace. I knew nothing about my aunt, who was this architect. Um, and so little bits and pieces, and then on my mother's side of the family, um, like, one of my grandmothers or great-grandmothers was one of the first doctors in the Shanghai region. In fact, the weird story is as I was having my first, our first child, I had a doctor at New York um, University, Dr. Olivia Wan, who's from Shanghai, just like my mother. And Dr. Wan starts speaking to my mother. And it turns out that Dr. Wan's father, I think, was delivered by one of these two sister doctors in Shanghai, my great-grandmother. So it, it's this very strange world that comes together and then connects and then disconnects. But I didn't really ask growing up much about it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, no, I, was, I think I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to be different. I didn't, I mean, I think um, I, probably spent the first 20 years of my life wanting to be as American as possible. And um, I think in my work, certainly through my 20s and into my 30s, I began to become aware of how so much of my art and architecture has a decidedly Eastern character. And I think it's only in the last decade that I've really understood how much I am a balance and a mix. And I, I say there's a struggle at times, and I think it's played out. I mean, it's very funny. I mean, I, I love science, then I went into art, so there's this, but I approach things very analytically at times. So there's the left side, right side of the brain. There's the fact that I choose to um, pursue both art and architecture as completely separate fields rather than merging them. And those two, I, I sometimes think the making of architecture is antithetical to the making of art. And then the East-West, and I think a lot of it is there is a struggle because I come from two heritages. And they go like this sometimes, and they go like this sometimes. The process I go through in the art and the, the architecture I actually want it to be almost childlike. It's almost a percolation process. I don't want to predetermine who I am um, thematically in my work, which I think has made my development be, sometimes I think it's magical, sometimes I think I'll never do another piece again. But basically, you don't know who you are. But yet, I feel much better as I've hit um, the 40s, so to speak, that's sort of frightening to say, um, that I'm m more whole because I understand. I'm more at peace. I'm not fighting it. I was fighting it in my 20s really hard. I mean, it was a real, there was an anguish in that 
I mean, ironically, the work is much more peaceful. All my work is much more peaceful than I am. And maybe the work in that sense is trying to find a resolution between what was probably a struggle. I would say there were um, many influential teachers. Um, a funny phrase comes to mind, sort of an awful phrase, teacher's pet. And I, yes, I was one of those. The other kids probably hated me. Yes, that's probably why I didn't have any friends. I really enjoyed um, hanging out with some of the teachers. I remember this one chemistry teacher who, um, she, it was very weird. She was our science teacher in junior high, Miss McCallum. And then she got married, Mrs. Batchelder. And, no, 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 sorry. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember her married name. Mrs. Batchelder was my favorite math teacher in junior high. I had a lot of favorite teachers, and then Miss McCallum got married, and she ended up being my chemistry teacher when I got to high school. And we would go after school. We'd like make up. It was sort of perfect. I liked making explosives. She liked hanging out, and then we'd blow things up. <laughs> and we were. One time, I made this incredible powder, flash powder, and I made way too much of it. And I remember I was working out of a, a crock that must have been this thick walls, and it exploded. I mean, it, it was bad. It was stupid, stupid, stupid of us. And I couldn't hear. Like, it was loud. It was louder than a rifle report. And the head science teacher comes in, and he's a very serious man, and he's looking around. And he's going, what did I just hear? And we were deaf at that point. We couldn't hear anything. We were going, nothing, nothing. I didn't hear anything. Did you hear it? And so what you don't realize, I think, is that some of your teachers are actually closer in age to you than, than you think. And so there's supposed to be this distance. But by the time I was like a senior in high school, she was like maybe four or five years older than me, just maybe a little older. But we, we had a lot of fun doing that. And then there were other teachers, art teachers. Both my art teachers were just very wonderful throughout. But I would say that... Um, I really, really enjoyed my whole educational process, and um, and I, it was fun. I mean, that's what I actually thought was really fun. So yes, there were many influential um, people. The Tolkien series, J.R.R. Tolkien, the Narnia Chronicles, anything that was science fiction, fantasy related, I read. Anything. I have the most obscure science fiction fantasy collection that you could possibly have. It's like the Gorman Gas trilogy by Mervyn Peake. Top that. And then you like talk to other people later on in life and they go, oh, you read Mervyn Peake's The Gorman Gas trilogy? Which was actually really awful. But yes, I read it. And so I, I think I, I had shelves and shelves of um, this sort of pseudo sci-fi, not hardcore sci-fi, but um, but sort of in between science fiction and then the fantasy, and um, that's what I pretty much focused on. If I wasn't like making something, which I was mostly doing, read like a demon, didn't stop reading, um, and over summer vacations. Because if I'm working on an artwork, I tend to daydream while I'm reading, so I can't read when I'm working on a few projects. So I would take summer breaks, summer vacations, because you'd be in between um, work, and then I would just devour books voraciously. Like one, one year back from college, I think I read nothing but um, Nietzsche. I was probably the first kid in my high school to go to Yale. And, you know, Athens, Ohio, town of 15,000. I applied almost as a lark. Um, I didn't know where I was going to go to school. And I got in, and I was just so happy. And um, it was really surprising. And then, you know, when I got there, the whole shock of being 
in a way, not as well prepared <laughs> academically for, for, for an Ivy League school and learning that you were the dumbest person in your class, not the smartest. No, it was very, very intimidating. And um, it was also funny because my, as I started to really focus on art and architecture, my roommates were appalled. Like one semester, I never went to the library. I mean, I was pulling all-nighter after all-nighter, obsessing about this project or that, but like my brother to this day hasn't forgiven me that I didn't take a history course. I always took these like soft history courses like sociology and whatever. And I, and I think if I could do it all over again, I really missed out on some great courses. But I was so, in art or architecture, your project is only done when you say it's done. So if you want to rip it apart at the 11th hour and start all over again, and I was one of those crazy creatures, you never finish, at which point everything else, forget about. You just, so I would like, I just, and the sad thing is, and um, I think the saving grace is, I, I still got a fairly solid liberal arts undergraduate education, minus the history, which I'm still regretting. Um, but I, I really sometimes question students who have um, chosen to go into a, like an architecture school from day one, because I think they're missing out on the English courses, the science courses, the math courses. And if you can afford the time to do graduate and undergraduate, I would broaden your mind in undergrad and then specialize. Because I think for both art and architecture, you have your whole life ahead of you. Don't think that at age 18 you want to like just focus in on your own, you know, your own personal world. It's like open it up for a while. I think it's invaluable. I probably got to Yale um, much more sure of myself, much more confident, and all that got shot to hell in the first year. <laughs> and I remember, like, you go from being like, oh, the smartest in your school in Athens, Ohio, and then you get to an Ivy League school where everyone's, I didn't even know what a prep school student was. And I, they were all, like, in sophomore grade classes, and I'm stuck back in remedial English and remedial <laughs> biology, and it was, a humbling, a really humbling experience, which um, happens, you know. It's this whole thing about, oh, public school, private school, it, it's tough. And yet I wouldn't, I wouldn't have wanted to go anywhere else because I actually think um, a lot of my classmates who went through an incredibly rigorous, competitive high school for years they hit sophomore, junior year, and they were so tired. And it's like, I actually am glad I didn't have any of that. I wasn't, I wasn't obsessing about my SAT scores or my PSATs. It, you know, I love getting straight A's, but that was almost more for me. And now I look at the pressure kids go through in high school. You should be having more fun in high school. You should be exploring things because you want to explore them and learning because you love learning, not worrying about the fact that, oh, at this private school, only three are going to go to this school and only three. I mean, that's a tough competition. I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, it's a, t it's a tough one, but the education there is, is great too. So, you know, we have two young children, so we'll have to go through this debate. Oh, about five years ago, seriously. I, and I thought I was going to become a veterinarian. I loved animals growing up. Then I sort of switched into, in high school, I was definitely going to become a field zoologist because I loved animals and I loved the environment. And um, now I'm always making things. My dad's a ceramicist, dean of fine arts. My mother's a poet and English professor, but I've also got the side of me, like half the kids who I went to school with would say, oh, she's going into science. The other half would say, say oh, she's going into English. But it was always very academic. None of us connected, even though art was what I did every day, 
Um, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me that I would be an artist. Then I get to Yale and my advisor is a science advisor because I've specified I, my interest is, is, um, is um, field zoology in, in um, animal behavior because I actually want to go out in the field and understand why, you know, why animals are what they are. And um, it was Dr. Apfel, who I still talk to every now and again, and he goes, well, Yale's animal behavior program is probably not what you're going to approve of. And I said, well, why? He said, um, it's neurologically based, and um, that it dealt with vivisection. And I didn't even know what vivisection was, but it basically means um, dissecting the animals while they're still alive. And I looked at him and I said, you're absolutely right. Like, ethically, there's no way. And um, so though I was actually tracked pre-med at that time, I, I thought of, oh, this isn't going to work. And then I thought of architecture, because I thought it was this perfect combination of art and math art and science. Um, because in high school, one of the independent courses I took was, it was way before computers. It was all the punch card. I ended up, well, two or three of the courses I took at the university were teaching myself Fortran, BASIC, and COBOL. And I loved logic, math, computer programming. I loved systems and logic approaches. And so I just figured architecture is this perfect combination. Then it takes me seven years of architecture school to realize that I think like an artist. And even though I build buildings and I pursue my architecture, I pursue it as an artist. I deliberately keep a tiny studio. I will hire firms or cause firms to be hired to work with me. I don't want to be an architectural firm ever. I want to remain as an artist building either sculptures or architectural works. And in a way, what I disliked about architecture was probably the profession. I still am an artist. And basically, what does that mean? Um, it's much more individual. It's much more about who you are and what you need to make, what you need to say for you. Whether someone's going to look at it or not, you're, you're still going to do it. Jim, <laughs> I failed. In fact, that was the only teacher I think that really disliked me. <laughs> and I disliked her just as much and we won't name her. <laughs> I was really good at track, but then anything else in gym, just shoot me. I, I just, you know, I was the smallest in my class and it was probably from when I was little that like you would play that stupid game where like, they shoot, they would pick teams or you would have to break through the line and nobody would want me on their team. Because of course I weighed like half the weight of everyone else and there's no way I could break through the line. So from that moment on, like any anything involving like gym was like, get me out of here. <laughs> Twofold, I think there are two things going on, one, I'm sure because my parents were both educators, that through these larger issue subjects, one, I might be making up for all the history courses I didn't take, and two, it is a way where we can teach the next generations. And it's this need in me to help out, whether I'm doing that or whether I'm volunteering for some environmental organization. The other side of me, in solidly pursuing art and architecture um, is doing it out of my own drive. Not that the monuments aren't also part of that aesthetic, but they, the monuments in general draw on a larger social issue. The artworks deal much more specifically, one, with my personal love of landscape, the environment, how we see the land through a microscopic view, a satellite view of the earth. That's my art. And there's been a very strong progression in the last 10 years as that's developed. And there's a show of which part of it's traveling in Europe right now, um, a show called Topologies that went throughout this country, 
which again deals with a love of nature, naturally occurring phenomena, but seen through a 20, 21st century lens, the lens of technology. So in a way it's landscape art and compared to like a 19th, 18th century landscape painting, we have a couple different technological ways of viewing our world. And I play off that in my art. And I think art is very tricky because it's what you do for yourself. It's much harder for me to make those works than in a way the monuments or the architecture because those have functions. Architect the monuments, it's a symbolic function, but it's still, you're solving a problem. The architecture, you're definitely, you're making art, but it's surrounded by a problem solving. It's like math, it's a puzzle to me. I love figuring out puzzles. The artwork on the other hand is go into a room and make whatever you want to make. And it's very, very hard. The role of art in society differs for every artist. For me personally, it's, I think my art, which are not in a way, I'm, I compartmentalize in an odd sort of way that they all blend. Um, it's probably to give people a different way of looking at their surroundings. It's making people aware of nuances, changes, and depth height, making you aware of perceptions at a very, very subtle level. Um, possibly focusing you on a new way of looking at your surroundings, at the land. Um, that's art to me. I think what makes art valuable is it is about an individual expressing what they think is a part of them and um, variety and difference and um, clashes is what makes art valuable. That there is no one defining idea of what art is or what it should do. And that's what makes it art. That it has no rules. That um, it's so individualized in that sense. And yet, because we are born and we come from a very specific time, it is a reflection of exactly who we are at this time without ever having to be consciously thought of that way. It just is. I'm very young, I think, architecturally. And I think, um, especially because I equally spend as much time in the art, I only can take on one or two architectural projects at any given time. So my... Um, career in architecture will take twice as long, maybe three times as long, because the other part of me is doing, um, doing another project on extinction, which I'm starting out. But basically, I'm not in a hurry to do a lot of projects. I am very focused on being fairly resolved in each project I take on. I think the artwork, I've sort of made myself whole, so where I go next with landscape, I'm very curious on, but there's a, a sense of arrival. The architecture is younger. I've had very few um, freestanding projects, um, and I'm working on one right now, a bakery for um, uh, the Greyston Foundation. They're a not-for-profit group that build um, housing for the homeless, AIDS hospices. This one baker in particular, hires at times um, people out of prison, um, but also other people in uh, sort of a economically hard neighborhood. And um, I am drawn to institutional, not-for-profit, museums, educational. I did a library for the Children's Defense Fund. I'm working on a chapel for them. Um, but so I, I'm interested in in keeping the balance between the art and the architecture. And I think that is the goal, to keep it up, to build, make 
more works, see where I go with it, not lose one to the other, and um, I don't know, explore what it means to me. What They are, in a way, portraits. Um, who you are, uh, what you want to be. And I think a lot of the architectural works will deal with um, being environmentally sensitive, sustainable, using much more passive solar, passive cooling. But on top of that, artistically, aesthetically, what they are, um, it's sort of creating who you are. And they're very simple. And yet simple, mixing in with it um, a warmth that normally probably isn't, isn't what minimalists are thought to have. So I think there's, an, there's a, um, a humanness, an intimacy. So there's a real um, warmth to the simplicity. But again, can I reduce it? Can I keep it to be a reduced, clean palette, all natural materials? One of the key things in the architecture is that I want always to have you feel connected to the landscape so that you don't think of architecture as this discrete, isolating object, but in a way it frames your views of the landscape, which is a very Japanese notion. So that the, the house is a threshold to nature or basically begins to explore our relationship to nature. So again, this love of the environment comes back through all the work. You have to work <laughs> very hard. I mean, I don't know how many days and nights I've spent. Um, I think you have to be forever questioning what you're up to. I think you have to both have conviction and be sure, and at times completely question everything and anything you do. I think you have to understand that no matter how much you study, no matter how much you know, no matter how much you might, you know, you can, it's, it's, it's funny, it's like, it's almost like the side of your brain that has sort of the smarts won't help you in making art, necessarily. Now that's a frightening notion, that nothing you might learn will help you in, in being creative. In fact, it's, at times it could hurt you if you think too hard. Sometimes you have to stop thinking. Sometimes you shut down completely. And then every time you do that, you're afraid if you'll ever start up again. And I think that's, that's true in any creative field. Nothing's ever guaranteed. Nothing's ever a sure thing. And um, all that came before doesn't predicate what you might do next. Um, I guess, to me, how we are using up our home, how we are um, living and um, polluting the planet is frightening. It was evident when I was a child. It's more evident now. I think we have had a bad habit as a species of thinking of ourselves in our separate little pods. And those pods went from being the village to being the country to being, you know. And now we have to think in terms of environmental solutions in terms of a global outlook. That, that we have to, if we're going to be making pesticides illegal in this country, but then shipping those same chemicals down to other countries because they don't have as strict an environmental law, that is a crime. That's got to stop. We have to take responsibility, and we have to start solving these problems on a global outlook. And yet we have no mechanisms to govern on an international level, really. 
That's, that's, that is what is going to be key. And um, I think for me, um, you know, I completely believe in what's happening with um, the greenhouse effect and with the ozone layer. And um, only X percentage of the population are contributing to those pollutants. What happens when the rest of the world modernizes? Can we learn from what we've made as mistakes before we make them in another country? Does one country have a right to say that to another country? So, so basically we have some huge issues and I think in the next 10, 20 years if we don't have a much stronger concern for the environment on a very political level, we're in trouble. We are in trouble and yet Everyone focuses on the economy and it, or individual prosperity. We have to begin to um, figure out how we're going to deal with this. To me, the American dream is probably being able to follow your own personal calling and that to be able to do what you want to do is an incredible freedom that, that we have. And it, it provides for opportunities that you don't get in all, that many other countries. I, th I think the American dream also represents that we have a responsibility to um, share it and to not just sort of hoard that freedom, but hopefully share that freedom with other countries and with people within our own country that don't have that freedom. The artist has a responsibility to themselves as an individual. I do not believe an artist um, Again, it goes back to diversity and variety. Some artists might feel that their work wants to be socially focused. Others, art, artists won't. You need both. Otherwise, you kill art. And we all lose out.